You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the CRM Archaeology Podcast, episode 270 for August 9th, 2023. I'm your host, Chris Webster. On today's show, we talk about writing proposals. What are they? What can you do to maybe win? And what should you not do? So get ready to work for free because the CRM Archaeology Podcast starts right now. Welcome to the show, everyone. Joining me today is Heather in her kitchen in Southern California. Hi, everyone. <laughs> and Doug with child in Scotland. <laughs> yep, that, that's oh, yeah, we can hear. And hello, everyone. Right on cue. <laughs> right on cue exactly yeah she's actually uh, she's better than her sister she actually like does this on a timely manner we'll have to have her do nice. the outro uh chris so that it's it's all lined up on time <laughs> well yeah exactly. i think it's be better than you doug so <laughs> right right yeah and and bill i don't know what his life story is but he was in like saint croix last time we recorded and now he's in the netherlands like he's gone back there he's gone back to denmark and now he's in the Netherlands. Uh, I, I was like, are you moving there, Bill? I, I don't know what's happening, but uh, <laughs> yeah, he, he likes it over there. And then Andrew's in Hawaii, I'm pretty sure, unless he's coming back today. So we're literally spread across the world right now, but I'm glad that three could join. And I mentioned backgrounds and, and anybody who hasn't seen my RV, this is the side of it. <laughs> if you're looking at on YouTube, if you don't know what I'm talking about, um, head over to the Archaeology Podcast Network on YouTube and you can see our... Uh, our YouTube channel. We're starting to put everything up there. And this is the second episode we're recording with video on. Doug doesn't have a camera available. So it's Heather and I on the video today. But we are um, starting to do this more and more just to have more engagement over there on that platform. Because that's where a lot of people, you know, listen to podcasts and, and watch shows. It's a, it's a very popular place to do that. So we may as well embrace it. So, okay. Well, Heather, it was your topic today. And it's... Uh, a topic that can be a, a sore subject for a, a lot of young, yeah. uh, new firm owners and uh, and people getting into the business, but also people have been doing this forever. <laughs> right. So, yeah. So what are we what are we talking about today? We are talking about proposals. I actually think that proposals and understanding how to write proposals, even if you've never okay. written a proposal, you don't want to write a proposal, no ambition to write a proposal. Yeah. I think that understanding the process helps at any level, helps mm -hmm. a archaeologist and CRM at any level, um, because it helps you understand the process. It helps you understand why budgets are important, why sometimes there might be more wiggle room in the fields than there is in the lab or vice versa. And why, you know, I think maybe, it, I, at least for me, when I was beginning, it was a bit of a puzzle to understand why, why... Why do we do this a phase one one way and then we do a phase one a different way right you know for the next project and it's uh can be it can be confusing so I thought yeah. just going through that process might be a good idea and and just setting the stage here because we're talking about uh, you, you've got some stuff in the notes here like defining an RFP I think we should even step back a little further you know RFP is request for proposal but you also see RFQs out there request yes. for quote yes. it really just kind of depends on who's sending it out to be honest yep. with you and oh, yeah. they can be different so things different. <laughs> yeah. and there's I, I would say probably 70 percent eh, 60 percent of the proposals that I write have no RFP or RFQ mm -hmm. it's just the client saying I need something I have no idea what I need and what is the process to make sure that you are doing uh, your due diligence, make sure you're uncovering everything in the proposal that the client needs. Right. So. so in that case, then we're really talking about, I would say, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I trust me, you've done a lot more of these than I have in the past, but the major differences I see between certain proposals, like formally requested ones through say an agency and an existing client you may have that's just like, hey, I need a proposal for this new project. Some of the major differences I see there is one of them, you probably have a templatized format that you guys use and you send it out saying, this is what we're going to do. This is how much it's going to cost. And this is when we expect to get it done. But agency proposals often have a very predefined format that you have to use with predefined sections. And I need this. It can't be more than 10 pages. Sometimes it's got to be these and all that other stuff. Those are the big differences I see. Do you see anything else 
different yeah. surrounding that? Um, I think, well, you brought up a really good point. The difference between what we call an RFP and an RFQ, and we should probably provide definitions. So an RFP is request for proposals. RFQ is requests, uh, request for qualifications. I heard you, did you call request for quotes? There, there may be other, you know, acronyms. Yeah. Um, my understanding, you know, and, and it just also probably depends on the agencies that you're working with in the area of the country or the world that you're working in. So, mm -hmm. um, but you know, they're all similar. So a request for proposal is when, like you said, an agency come, you know, comes to you. And a lot of times private clients do that too. Clients that are a little bit more savvy, they have an attorney on staff, they have counsel that they want to make sure that everything is covered. They want to control the work a little bit more than just the you know, an average client. And then a request for qualifications is a little different than that. That's when you are oh, yeah. presenting your qualifications that you can do the work and you're going to do it well. And there's various different agencies that put that out first. There's a reason for that. They have requirements that they have to fulfill many times, many times federal agencies where they have quotas and things that they have to fulfill. So that request for qualifications is the first step. Then after that, they take their select, the people that they select, they consider qualified, mm -hmm. and then they send an RFP from there. And then you, you work off that RFP. Then you have projects where they want the scope, but they don't want the cost yet, or they want the scope and the cost are delivered separately. So yeah. a decision is made based on your scope and how, whether or not they believe that you're going to be able to follow through with everything that you're saying you're going to. Uh, number two, they're also looking at making sure that you followed all the directions and mm -hmm. that you did present everything in your scope that they were asking for. And then based on that, then they look at, at the cost. So the decision is made solely on the proposal. <laughs> Yeah. And I have heard, you know, unless you're a well-known company to the agency, you're, you have a really good, well-developed relationship. Like if you, I don't know, if you just miss something stupid in the proposal that they required, they're probably not going to ding you for that too much. But if you're relatively new and they don't really know you that well, and you haven't done a lot of projects, I mean, I've heard that if you don't get exactly right what they're asking for, you're missing yeah. something that you're turning in, you're out because they received 800 other proposals and yeah. they don't have time for you. <laughs> you know, so. there's, I think... <laughs> some people, I, I, to be candid, I believe that there are many times that the decision makers have one company they want to use. Right. And the fact, oh, sure. that you're, the fact that you're not following the directions is just, you know, if, if you miss one little thing, it's an excuse not to select you. Yeah. And you know, I mean, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, no. It, I mean, again, I'm a really small company, and I've done a number of proposals, and I've always heard the ratios about ten to one for you know relatively new companies, where you'll you'll win one proposal for every ten you send out, and the ratio might even be less than that. Now, if you've got yeah, a well established saying. relationship, yeah, and you've got things going on, then it might be a little bit higher. But mm -hmm. you know, for those, I mean, you're just you're just turning in a lot of proposals, and like you said, a lot of times you know they're required, especially the agencies, they're required to send out a request because that's that's their public due diligence, right? They have to do that. Right. But they are just like probably hoping with crossed fingers that a couple firms that they've worked with in the past actually submit and they're more than likely going to get it. But they also have a responsibility to the public to get it at the cheapest price. So you can win if you come in underneath, but then that brings up the whole thought of lowballing and the reason nobody gets paid very well and, and it just brings the whole industry down. Or... You lowball with the idea that you're going to have a contract amendment. And so that's also the fear sure. on, on the side of, and you know, your relationship that you have and what you've established with that client agency or private, you know, helps them understand that you don't do that. But there's a lot of companies obviously that lowball and there's people that are making decisions that maybe aren't as savvy. Mm -hmm. And they go with the low ball offer and almost every time it comes up where there's contract amendments and it ends up being more expensive in the long run. Or it can be more expensive if the company that low balled is less experienced. And I'll tell you, there's been several, I mean, a decent amount of our work is cleaning up other people's messes. So think sure. about it. You've already paid another company to do the work and now you have to have somebody else come in and do the work all over again. or 
try to come and and fix what they can. Yeah. <laughs> right. Doug, you got a comment? Doug? Doug, we can't hear you. Hmm. Can you hear me now? Okay. We can. Go ahead. Pretend yeah, that never sorry. happened. I'll edit it out. No, no. The, she, she was playing with the microphone and turned it on mute uh, manually nice. over nice. here. Well, this yeah, will be was... on YouTube because it's not edited, but just continue for the podcast. We'll edit all this out. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> you guys sort of mentioned a, a preferred person. Um, I would say, especially when you have, like, say, private sector, there's not mm -hmm. necessarily a preferred candidate as preferred candidates and that sure. you know they'll they'll be happy they'll know the work of several people and that's usually when they go out for a sort of private tender as heather was saying and yeah there's they would i would say there's not necessarily like there's always this just the one some of them will be like yeah we're happy with with you know a couple of these people if they, they got it both. Yeah, I hope it happens yeah. both ways. I mean, I I know for certain there's, yeah, I can I'm just like in my mind right now I can think of one agency, not agency I should say, but an entity or an organization that wants one one group. That's it, and you know it's just gotten to the point where you don't even propose anymore, and that that's another mm -hmm. thing we can talk about. But yeah, yeah, and I think in this first segment I do want to talk about the different types of things that you could expect us to, to do as a proposal. And one thing that's coming to my mind that I actually had quite a bit of success with is an IDIQ. And that is getting onto a, a five-year plan, basically, with an agency, well, often a military base or something like that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the in those circumstances, now IDIQ means, correct me if I'm wrong, indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity. So mm -hmm. basically, you're just saying, here's our qualifications. You're usually under a prime contractor, and they have subs that work, you know, different areas. And and the subs basically submit to the prime and they submit the whole package. And it's basically, here's what I can do this for. And one of the things that, oh my God, the uh, the China Lake project I worked on, that was under an IDIQ, I believe. And but, but basically we had to submit a table without knowing what could happen in the next five years. We had to submit a table that mm -hmm. said, if we do a project of small, medium or large size, whatever, however they define that, and they had definitions, this is what it's going to cost us. And then they have like five companies that won the ID, IDIQ. And when they have a new project within their area, they just look and see who's going to do it the cheapest of those five companies. And you get it. There's no proposal. There's no anything. That's how it worked. That is incredibly stressful because if you misjudge something and you end up having to do it <laughs> cheaper than yeah. it is, there's, you can't even sub submit an amendment in most cases. You just have to do it. Yeah. You yeah. know, it's there's you know a lot of proposals Boy, we could go into the, the weeds on this, but I'll just say this much that, you know, I, I think smaller companies, it's a little, it's a little different because there's federal agencies have a requirement for a certain amount of uh, a DBE, I mean, disadvantaged mm -hmm. business enterprise yeah. that are, and so a company like ours, that's moderately big or a moderately sized company do not qualify for those. And so either we have to bring somebody in as a, you know, as a vendor, as, as a subcontractor, or we just don't go after them. And so I think as a small business, and a lot of times the small businesses, that's all they go after are those yeah. ones that are, you know, that are required to have DBEs. So, but I can think, you know, we have agencies that have a five year, five year contract with us and we have, we have to set just exactly what you're saying. We have to not necessarily say this is how much each task is going to cost, but we give them our billing rates and yeah. our and we have them stratified based on you know the the years that the contract covers, and then we and we have to stick to it. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, talk about challenging, especially you know what what if there's a global pandemic during one of those years? You know, how does that change things? <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah. So, all right. Well, let's take a break. And then on the other side, we'll come back and, and dive into these proposals a little more and actually writing one back in a minute. Welcome back to episode 270 of the CRM Archaeology Podcast. And we are talking about writing proposals, basically, and the different types of proposals. But now I think we're, uh, unless we got more to talk about there, we should just get into actually putting these things together. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I think let's look at Maybe just go down the road 
of an RFP? How do you yeah. create a proposal from an RFP? So we alluded to the fact that it is important to look at all the details sometimes, and you, you kind of get your feel for it. You understand which agencies are pickier than others, but it is important as a rule to follow the RFP page length, resumes, how long the resumes should be, are the resumes counted in the page length? Now, I'm fortunate that we have a publications department that pretty much oh, nice. they go through the whole RFP and they do all those types of things. They make you know marks for that. And if it's mm -hmm. a larger RFP, they write quite a bit of it with the boilerplate that we have. But then when it comes to scope for specific tasks, then... To me, I, I actually like it. I, I think it's probably a little crazy, but I enjoy it because this is where you get to be creative. This is where you get to not only show that you read the RFP, you understand what they need, but also you can say, okay, you know what? Uh, very respectfully, I don't think you need this and this is why. Or I think that if we go down, you know, maybe this is a different avenue that you want to, you know, as far as the task goes, this is a different approach. And this is why we believe this is the case. And, and we've won, we've won projects just on that. Wow. Thinking outside the box, helping, uh, and, and especially when it's a cost saving measure. And if it's not a cost saving measure, it's going to cost more. Why in the long run, they want to do this? Why is this going to increase the defensibility of the work that you're doing? Why is this essential if you're going to add a task? So that creativity, I really enjoy that. I know for some, it's they don't enjoy it. But <laughs> yeah, I think that that to me, having not only following the rules, but at the same time, finding that balance between following the rules and customizing the proposal is, is essential to winning. You know, how do you guys deal with proposals that say, well, they require maybe specific things, right? I'm thinking of one in particular that I lost to a company, Logan Simpson. In fact, I've talked about this on the radio, on the air before. I don't care who, <laughs> if they know, but uh, <laughs> I'm so pissed. No, it was a, it was a project right in my backyard, basically. And, and we didn't win it and we didn't win it by just a, just a narrow margin. Cause you can, you can talk to the agency and say, why didn't we win this? Right. Yes. I mean, they, yes, they have to tell you that. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. And we didn't win it because they said that there was a bunch of remote areas and ATVs would likely be required to access some of these areas. And I was like, great, we have a, a place in town we can rent ATVs from. We can tow it with our truck. And, and if we win this, we'll get those ATVs. Well, Logan Simpson said they have ATVs and they'll use them. So the agency was like, OK, well, they don't have to rent them. And, you know, because what if you can't rent them and what if something's going on? And that's literally why we lost the project. That's, yeah. that's it. <laughs> I was so mad. <laughs> How do well, you deal with that's, stuff that's a requirement that you don't have? And if Logan, if they, what's their, what's the name Logan of that? Simpson. Logan, Logan Simpson. Logan Simpson, yeah. Simpson. If they, what, I, I would actually venture to say they may not have even had ATVs. Exactly. Me but too. they're saying <laughs> they have access to ATVs, just like you have access to ATVs. And they were getting a little, you know, creative with their, with their right. verbiage. But, you know, that is... Did you learn something from that? I did. Be creative with my verbiage. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah, Doug, go ahead. Well, that's actually what I was going to talk about, being creative with your verbiage. <laughs> and not actually being creative, but it, it, it's a weird thing. It, as you do more and more proposals, you'll find out. And, it, it man, it's it's almost like a, a crapshoot because what you're looking at is the it's the people who are evaluating that. And if you mm -hmm. know them, you might know what they're looking for. But if you don't, it, it could be so, you know, you've just mentioned things of like, oh, you're supposed to have that. Um, and that's how you lost the, the contract. I've gone through other projects where it's like, oh, these are must haves. And actually, they didn't turn out to be must haves at all. And yeah. that's, that's just it's, it's it, uh, I think I've heard someone describe it as like fly fishing. And that like, each time you're, you're throwing out a different sort of lure, hoping that it, it works and, and the fish bite and it doesn't, sometimes it doesn't work because sometimes you could be super detailed and probably that's mm -hmm. actually what happened to you, you, Chris, you were probably detailed and said where you, where exactly you're going to get your ATVs. Right. And 
possibly Logan Simpson just said, we will source ATVs or we have a source of ATVs, you know, something very generic enough that they probably might be renting them. But the person who's reading that can only base their, usually, hopefully they're yeah. only basing their decision off of what's presented. And, and like, it's a crazy thing. Like sometimes you provide too much detail and it costs you the project. Sometimes you don't provide enough detail and they're like, actually, we wanted like, we wanted minute by minute breakdown of, of, you know, all your times of when you're going to set off and your, your work packages and all this stuff. So it's, it's really tough. Sometimes, you know, being more vague helps you. Sometimes being more detailed helps you. And you start to get a feel if you've dealt with the same organizations or people, what they're looking for, that could sometimes help you. But other times, ah, roll the dice. You, yeah, you put I, out what you think it is there, and hopefully yeah. the person who's reviewing it reacts better to, um, you know, a detailed proposal if you put in a detailed proposal or, or yeah. detailed I, details. Yeah. You, you can Sorry. also hedge your bets. And, you know, what I've done before is that I, I do more of that broad sense, unless, of course, the RFQ requests a, a more specific, right? But I think the really best bet is to go with what the RFQ requests and then put in verbiage in there. I love assumption verbiage. And I, I mean, assumptions are obviously essential, but it's more than just the typical assumptions. And then mm -hmm. also putting verbiage in there that alluding to the fact that more details can pr be provided upon request, but not in that kind of just blanket way that you ex say, okay, well, there is a much more complex, you know, approach to this, which we will be happy to explain upon request type of thing. Sure. And so then that gives you that option to kind of say, Hey, you know, there's a lot more to this, especially when you have a page limit, you know, some of these page limits are insane. <laughs> and, yeah. and, you know, and the other thing is that you have to think about is that the people that are reading these, they don't want to read these, especially <laughs> they really don't. And, you know, especially if, if, if there's like a hundred of these and they're all, you know, we've had, we've had proposals 150 pages long. It's insane. Mm -hmm. So they're looking and they have people that go and vet them before they get to the next stage. Okay. Did they get all the, and that's where you can get kicked out before even the decision makers see it is by the fact that the people that were vetting it before it got to them said they didn't, they didn't follow this direction, that direction, that direction, you're gone. I mean, I mean, no. this isn't any different than, you know, crafting your CV and applying for a job. You're just yeah. doing it for a, from a company standpoint. So you got to follow the rules. And then just like a CV, you got to tread the fine line of following the directions and giving them what they asked for and, and saying, yes, I do have a field school. I do have a, you know, a degree and I've got this relevant experience. Same thing with, with proposals. You know, we've got these qualifications. We have relevant experience in the area and or with the agency. And, you know, here's our past, our past performance. But you also have to tread the line of providing all those things, but also realizing, yes, they're humans that don't want to read any of this. So don't be too, mm -hmm. too verbose, too descriptive right. and too flowery with your language. Just give them the details and call it right. good. You know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So. All right. So how do you just looking at your notes here? Let's talk about some of the potentially out of scope and, and things okay. that you just can't anticipate. How do you build that in without saying, you know, we may need all this extra money because then you won't win the project. <laughs> okay. So what you do is that you are very specific with your verbiage um, so that maybe they don't, and this isn't pulling wool over anyone's eyes, but this sure. is covering yourself. So you are very specific with the language. Like I can't tell you, talk about thinking too much, but you have to <laughs> in this area, the devil's in the details. So you have to look at, what is covered from a legal sense, what would be covered and what you're saying you're going to do. Yeah. And then you have assumptions. Now you don't want to have 30 different assumptions for one task. Right. But that's why writing your language is really important that you do it in a concise and very accurate way so that when let's say something happens, I, I, this is a very easy one. I think everybody uses it where you say that, you know, the, one of the assumptions is that no resources will be found. Right? Yeah. So that's one example. No resources are going to be found. Why would you want to say that? You're going to say that because if a resource is found, now all of a sudden 
You have all these other things that you have to do yeah. to address that resource that you don't want to go full fledged and say, oh, okay, well, we're going to put everything in the proposal because we may find a resource. You do that and all of a sudden your number will knock you out before they even read it. So your budget will knock it out before you even read it. So just, you know, those kinds of assumptions are important and making sure that you're, yeah, you're very specific with your language. Yeah. yeah. The assumptions for those that don't know what we're talking about, I even have those on some other contracts and proposals I put together for this software thing that I do. I mean, the assumptions can really save your ass because you're not yes. saying this and this and this is going to happen. You're just saying, hey, I'm literally assuming that this is going to happen. And if it doesn't, we're going to have a conversation about it, right? Like during the project, you know, if it, yeah, and it goes beyond finish, this, you know. Yeah. You finish it off in a nice way. You say, you know, like if, if additional, additional tasks are required. Yeah. We'll be happy to, you know, provide a supplemental, uh, you know, cost and yeah, or scope and cost. Yeah. Go ahead, Doug. Yeah, I think that's one one of the key things to get across to people if if you're starting out with this is actually this is usually, in most cases, forming part of your contract. It's mm-hmm. you know, it's, yeah. it's it'll be legally binding. So I, gosh, there are so many different ways of doing contracts, and it may be one of the things where. If, depending on the project you're on, you it, your proposal might be rewritten in an, a different contract, taking words out of it, saying you know mm-hmm. you're delivering these things and stuff like that. But uh, especially on small projects, and actually even like at a lot of places now, you know it, it'll differ from country to country. But essentially, even like a request for quote, that essentially those emails back and forth form a contract between you and the individual. So if you have something small like that and you're getting requests for quotes, always include a line about your terms and conditions. Mm-hmm. And like if you're if you're re- if you're listening to this and you're like I don't have terms and conditions, get terms and conditions. Like you need to have something that can form a contract that if your proposal goes forward, you don't necessarily want to include all those details about like oh we need to be paid on the 6th of 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 the month and stuff like that. But you do want to have something like a terms and conditions that are included in even the smallest of of quotes. Like if it, especially like uh, this is definitely more a UK thing. But you know, it's very small projects. Maybe like you know, a watching brief would be a monitoring job for maybe like a day or half a day yeah. or something like that, where you just get a farmer who calls you up and's like, "Oh, I need to have this done. Can you do it? How much will it cost?" And you send back a quick quote you need that's that's basically your your contract right there Mm -hmm. it's a legally binding aspect and if you're missing key parts of that it'll it'll be a huge pain later if something goes wrong so yeah just um if i could drive one point home for our listeners or i guess viewers now as well listeners slash (laughs) viewers is that like if you're going to start doing this yeah it's it's not something you could sort of slap together without any consideration because right. you, you might be opening yourself up to a lot a world of pain um, and some sloppy language of something like I, I've seen it happen to companies where basically they've got ho- on the hook for everything they couldn't renegotiate anything because they'd put in some sloppy text because yeah. no one looked it over and basically it was they were going to do the project for that price and there was no renegotiation and yeah, it cost them a lot of money. Mm-hmm. You know, in the last few minutes of this segment, let's just talk about cost real quick here. Because again, we talked about lowballing, and sometimes, you know, sometimes to position yourself with the agency, knowing that you can, you, you're just trying to get your foot in the door as long as you're not going to do that forever, that won't necessarily bring the industry down. But it's hard for small companies to make that adjustment if they win. They want to do everything low so they can continue, and and they are, you know. I guarantee you right now, if a company is owned by, say, one person and there's no board of directors, there's no human resources department, there's no anything like that, then I don't care how many projects they're doing and what you're getting paid. They're sweating payroll every single week. They are not Mm -hmm. driving a Bentley. They are not, you know, uh, living the high life. So how do we... Even a few of us. Well, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, How do we... You know, how do we do this? How do we say, you know, we, we try to bid the right amount, but we don't want to bid too much. We don't want to bid too little. How do you, you know, how do you, how do you deal with that? I mean, a company your size might be able to say, take a hit on a project because you might be able to afford mm-hmm. it. Maybe bigger companies can it just to get your foot in the door. Right. Right. 
right? Yeah, and I'm sure that happens a lot, to be honest. Looks like Doug has. Yeah, Doug. Don't do it. Do not <laughs> do that. That is a. That is a. Uh, I'll, I'll speak from experience. Like it's it's a it's no don't don't yeah. don't. Because seriously, what happens is you think oh they'll get to know you and stuff like that, but literally like man, it's a huge thing, a huge thing in business. I've I've gone through training for this. Is part of what you do. I know this this is gonna like it. It sucks when you're starting out, and this is the hardest thing to learn is you can choose your clients. It doesn't feel like it. It it, it won't feel like it. Especially when you're desperate and like you know, you've had no work and you've got no jobs and you you really need something to to keep keep the lights on literally in some cases. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but you don't want those clients because those clients have basically hired you because you're the cheapest and they're always yeah. going to hire whoever's the mm -hmm. cheapest. So you will always lose out if someone is willing to go lower than you. And what you want as a client is someone they they'll definitely want value for money. But they'll want the value is the key part. So you want a client who's like who can realize when they look at those at those things that we're not going to take that low ball that's half of everyone else's bid because we know that they're going to fail and we're just going to have to redo everything again. As Heather was talking about earlier, how many contracts yeah. she gets from from companies like that, and you want that, but you actually want a client who can who can realize that things cost money and it's better to do it right the first time and cheaper and that's that's who you want and so if you're always winning on being the cheapest it, it's going to just cause you so much pain because someone else sure. is going to come in and be there's there's no loyalty and mm -hmm. you you prefer a client that has loyalty loyalty may not be the right word yeah but you that's that's the client you want is the one who will see that so yeah i, I would say at the very least just it's going to be the hardest thing you're ever going to do because you're you're going to look at it and looking at your bank account and seeing that negative uh, <laughs> balance and you're, you're very desperate for work. But yeah, uh, well, I, I, I could just say it, it's going to cause you more pain in the long run and it's <sighs> going to cause you pain for decades. I'll tell you, every time I drive my 33,000 pound RV over a new bridge, I think this was built by the lowest bidder. So, <laughs> <That's true. laughs> yeah, good. You know, we call it buying work. Uh, and mm -hmm. and I, I do agree with Doug. I do. But there are some instances where buying work is okay. I, one thing, you know, one example is you're both, both companies are growing at the same rate or mm -hmm. growing at the same time, right? You're going, you're entering into a, a different area together. So let's say one example might be drones, right? So you, you're doing some aerial work, LIDAR, and you know, some, there's various different disciplines within a larger environmental company or medium size like ours that where drones are helpful. And um, so you, the company, your client needs that and you don't yet have it. That's not yeah. our case, but you don't yet have it. It was our case at one point. So you don't sure. yet have it. And so you have a client who's willing to give you because based on the based on the experience they have with you and the relationship they have with you, they mm -hmm. know they believe you're going to do a good job. They're going to you're going to do right by them. And so maybe they purchase the equipment and then you down, you know, you your your fees for labor are very low or nothing. Right. right. So you're growing together. So I do think in that instance, buying work is a good idea. I've seen buying work work, but it, it, with a small company. And if you're doing it with because you don't have any other work that I agree with Doug is wrong. But if you're trying to get into a new market, buying work sometimes works. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, with that, let's take our final break. And on the other side, we'll talk about what happens if you lose and or win the proposal. Well, not and. You're, you're, it's going to be one or the other. <laughs> well, let's talk about what happens in either case. Back in a minute. Welcome back to episode 270 of the CRM Archaeology Podcast. And we're talking about proposals, writing proposals, and how do you prepare them and winning and losing proposals. So before we get into what happens if you do win or lose it, 
let's talk about cost because we were talking about assumptions earlier and you know one of the biggest assumptions and obviously one of the biggest costs associated with a proposal is will i find any sites i mean that's all tied up in a payroll that's your biggest cost but payroll's tied up into how long is it going to take and how long is it going to take is in, tied up into how do i how many sites am i going to find and of course you don't know how many you're going to find you have to do some sort of you know, either you have familiarity with the area or some sort of preliminary lit search for free, basically, because you're not getting paid to do that. And you have to say, well, there's been a lot of stuff found in that valley next door. So I can probably assume there's going to be things found here. I think we're going to find maybe 30 sites. So I'm going to put that in my assumptions. But what are those sites worth? How do you figure that out? You know, and how do you know if one's a two flake lithic scatter and one is a, you know, mm -hmm. mile long mining site? <laughs> you know, how do you how do you account for that? So let's hear it, Heather. How do you guys do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I I mean, I would say 80% of the proposals I write assume nothing's found. Yeah. And almost okay. the only time that there's an assumption that sites will be found is either at the RFP has that language in there, that no. they want you to scope for finding three sites, that sure. kind of thing. Or or if you know you're in an area that's sensitive and, and you just, you know, that's going, going to happen. And also you're you do have to judge your client. You have to judge, you know, is including that going to make a difference in whether or not you're selected. So, you know, there's so many things to think about as far as, you know, you really, we have, we have formulas that we believe each one of us has our own because based on your region, like you can't say that uh, I've heard of companies say, okay, well digging a, one by one mm -hmm. for data recovery costs this much money period <laughs> well it's going to cost different <laughs> on the coast in the sand than it would in the hard clay right sure. if you assume that your excavation is going to be the same it, no matter what your environment and what your type the soils that you're dealing with it's silly so mm -hmm. you really have to know your area and so there's i I base it on how many units and a lot of times it, the, you know, what this requires you to do is the ahead of time kind of get a bit of a quasi research design in place. Mm -hmm. Let's say if you're doing, you know, a data recovery or you're thinking you might have to do an evaluation. So you have these, these um, costs ahead in your mind. I think I'll let that just sit there for the two of you. And then we can talk about how do we take into account the different la uh, labor categories. Well, and along those lines, I actually did lose a couple of projects to BLM Nevada because, and I talked to them, you know, I was actually friends with a couple of agency people. So I was like, just calling them up and say, Hey, what's going on here? But I did lose a few because, you know, I was, and still am heavy into digital archeology. span Right. And I understand the benefits of doing that right. I know how to do it right. And I know how to save actually a lot of money on the back end, which means a lot of time. And I actually lost a few projects because my bid was too low. I, I and, was just, <laughs> I just lost yeah. one because they said your bid was too low. And I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah, I know. So, so you have to say, you know, even though you might be able to say, let's, let's say you're not lowballing, you're just more efficient. That could happen, yes. right? Let's say you're just yep. better at the other people that are doing this. And you're saying I'm more efficient and we can do this. And maybe you're a, a one person shop and, and you've got people, you know, with you and it's just, that's how you operate. Right. But you can, you, you still have to be competitive, but you don't yes. want to be, you don't want to raise your rates up to, to be too high, of course, because then you'll lose it. But then you're like, and you don't know what low is. You don't know what the low is. I mean, you can maybe guess, but you don't know what that is. You don't know what their error bars are because they are throwing out the low ones and they're throwing out the high ones and they're looking at everybody in the middle. So it's, you, it's frustrating. It is frustrating. I think that what you need to do when you're writing a proposal and let's say you are going to be lower. And I felt in this one that we just lost, I asked why for some feedback. They said, you were too, you were, you were too low. We believe that you didn't understand the level of work that would be required to get this. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. Personally, like I, I can think about this and learn from it. I personally think that they, had the fix in. They knew who they wanted and this was sure. just an excuse. But <clears throat> I do think that when you are, when you know, even if you don't know that you're going to be lower than others, having language in there that makes the client, the potential client curious 
as to why your price is the way it is, yeah. is, is a really good way to hook them that other way. So you have yeah. a low price and then also you have language in there that explains and makes them wonder, Oh, wait a minute. Maybe they have a different approach here. They're not just well, trying to lowball us. Yeah. They, they get scared by different too sometimes. Right. Because I did start including like paragraphs of data about my digital recording methods. And cause you always have to include methodology anyway, usually, I mean, yes. sometimes, but I, I would include, here's how we're able to do things more efficiently. Here's all this, yeah. but sometimes they just don't buy that either. They want tried and true and they want, they want status quo. You know, they don't, they don't want to be the guinea pig. <laughs> well then maybe that's where you follow your own advice. Maybe they're not the client for you. Exactly. Exactly. Doug. Yeah. I would say uh, this is sort of a pet peeve I have in archaeology is, is is Chris you, you were giving back all your efficiencies um, and this is what archaeologists do yeah we we instantly like in other uh, other disciplines other companies you pretty much even if you could do it cheaper you still bid about the same if you're winning work at that amount you keep that and if you could suddenly do it for a third cheaper, that third goes back into your pocket. Sure. Yeah. Whereas archaeologists in theory, yeah. Yes. And, and well, that's just it. Is like, and this this goes back to our our discussions about wages and and archaeology and stuff. And you know that that efficiencies go to the company, and then they can go out. They could go to the you know whoever the owner is, or they can go mm -hmm. out to the labor. And you know, that's that's. The system we work in, I, I, you may not like it, but it is the system we work in. Yeah. But that's just it. It's like instantly archaeologists are like, oh, well, we've, I don't know, we've discovered a way of doing this uh, a lot cheaper. Take the example of like digital recording. And pretty much without a doubt, every archaeologist handed that money right back to the their clients as opposed to taking it and with really low profit margins. And I know. Again, uh, this is we can't really jump into this in this short of time. But you, you absolutely need a profit margin, or if you're a nonprofit, a surplus margin, and mm -hmm. that's there for like you know something bad happens and you need money, sure. you, you, or you need that money to invest, like investing in the next level mm -hmm. of digital tech or mm -hmm. whatever. And you can't do that without a, a surplus. Unfortunately, people are like, oh, one to two percent. That's that's just enough. Maybe five percent if we're feeling really, really adventurous yeah. in archaeology. And I swear to God, that's so many archaeologists are like that. And you're like, no, yeah. like a minimum. If, if we're talking budgets, it's something we haven't talked yet. It's like wherever you're putting in a budget, you need to have a surplus, and that's that's not a contingency. Yeah, that is a surplus. That is a profit, and you should be aiming for, I'd say, a minimum of ten percent. Yeah, if yeah, not for sure. more. Agreed. Yeah, and and you're you're totally not wrong, and I definitely learned my lesson on that, right? Um, just like the ATVs, right? You learn <laughs> you learn through experience what to put in there. And like my last few projects that I did were pretty big. I had partners with these, and and I had to, even though I was, I was lower, and my client, my long term client, I had for a decade. She just came up with these huge projects we had to do, and I needed to bring in help for it. And you know, we all divided and conquered. But in order to put together you know, pricing that they would understand, I actually had to raise my rates up to come up to the other guys because they weren't nearly as low, but I was still making a profit. But because I had to raise my rates up, I was making a massive profit. And I was taking that and I was, I had really good wages. I had really good per diem. We went out to dinner every session and my company paid for it. You know, we, we just did all these fun things along with the project. But then again, like you're saying, Doug, and, and Heather, you know this too, uh, even a small company, even if you're just one person, if you have payroll, even if that's only one person, you need to expect to have twenty to $30,000 in the bank because you're not going to be able to pay them because you're not going to get paid for that project until right. it's done in most cases. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. you have to be able to cover that. So you do need the surplus, like Doug was saying. Yeah, Go ahead, Heather. Yeah. I, I wanted to talk just a little bit about you know, what, I know we've talked about it on the show before, but what, what goes in, what's the difference between an hourly and the billing rate? Yes. So yeah, that's the biggest thing. And, and also when we're looking at proposals, let's say we're looking at a, an, a site evaluation. Yeah. So a mid-level effort and you have to look at, you have to anticipate, okay, how, how many excavations do I need to do? 
Um, sometimes it's already in the RFP. Sometimes that's something you have to create. And these are other things that, you know, like Doug and, and, and Chris, you're saying about things that you're building in. Writing a proposal takes hours. Okay. That's time that you are expending. And that's something you're having to float. Now, sometimes if you're smart, you're writing these things up with the idea that they can be easily shifted into the actual report. A lot of this language can, you know, can work that way, but it's still a lot of effort that you're not getting paid for. And that could just be for nothing, you know, if you don't win. So, so anyway, so let's look at, you know, when we're, when we're looking at writing a proposal, we have to, it's not just about this is how many is how many excavation units we have to do. You have to look at, okay, so let's say we have five excavation units. How many would I anticipate? How many crew supervisors would I anticipate that I need? And how many archeological technicians that are just going to be excavating? How many of those do I need? How much lab time do I need? And so it's not just a number. You're, you're, you are dividing this number up into how many hours for each person. So, you know, I think sometimes people don't realize that when a company is hiring for an effort, they have only so many crew supervisor positions and only so many, you know, project lead positions, maybe just one. And then you have this many labor positions. And so, you know, people are like, well, how come I'm, you know, I got, I'm, I'm being hired no problem at $20 an hour. But then when I start getting bumped up, and I'm making $30 an hour, how come I'm, you know, how come I'm not getting hired as much? Because there's fewer, there's fewer roles for somebody that's getting paid at that, at that rate. And it's not because the company is being cheap on you. It's because they already have those crew supervising positions are filled. What they need right now are more excavators. So, you know, I think that that is one thing to understand. And, you know, your billing rate is typically triple you know, triple what you're paying the person. Yeah, sometimes I would say. Or sometimes it could be more depending on your billing rates. So billing rates are not an exact triple. Usually you yeah. have billing rates. And especially when you're writing proposals, sometimes companies, agencies will require that you give your set billing rates, your fee schedule. So you have to stick to those. And so sure. people have to fit within those. You were going to say something, Chris? Yeah. I mean, on the billing rate, I would say that the bigger the company, the the higher the multiplier, right? So if you're, mm -hmm. if you're getting paid $30 an hour and your billing rate is triple, that means they're charging $90 an hour for you. And a lot of people are like, well, where the hell is that other $60 mm -hmm. going? And I was like, the bigger the company, the more non-billable people you have, right? Yes. Like you have HR, you have uh, the safety department, you have, you know, all kinds of different people. You have people yes. checking your proposals. You can't mm -hmm. charge that against a project. You, <laughs> have, cases. you have overhead. So yeah. we just, our company, you know, companies need to calculate overhead, your overhead percentage. For sure. That's required. And so, you know, that's an eye opener when you think about that. It's also, you know, you have buildings, you have, you know, you have property that a larger companies have. I mean, these Taxes, are all things insurance. insurance. These yeah. are all things that are necessary. And, and so that triple, I would say 10% profit, like Doug was saying, and sometimes less, sometimes a little bit more, but 10% profit is pretty much what what a company gets after everything is sell, said and done. So that triple multiplier is covering so much, so much more than what, than just, it's not just, you know, $60 going into the pocket of, of the client right. or I mean, right. at the company. Yeah, Doug? for sure. Doug. Yeah. And also mentioned, I think we should also mention that depending on the organization you work with, there could be multiple budgets. So you could have potentially a, the project budget that you put together. And then, depending on your company, you can have an internal budget, and that can that can be very frustrating because a lot of times what will happen is, as we were mentioning, there's there's people on those higher overheads, those 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 uh, PIs, those project managers that they need to be able to find a place to charge their time, and sometimes they get like internally will get dropped on your project. So you you would have been perfectly on budget, you, you you've got the perfect project, everything works fine. And then suddenly, you know, two days of project manager time is dropped on your budget and it makes it look like 
you've gone over budget and it could, it could be quite frustrating to try to work those internal po- politics of an organization because you know you're trying to prove that you can do a project on time and there is a budget that just says no you you didn't do that but it's not your fault it's it'll be an internal thing but just to be aware that like yeah there a lot of times you'll have two project you'll have two budgets and and one is what you put in your proposal and the ones the other one's the internal one which mm-hmm. may not line up mm-hmm. and that could be quite frustrating if you're new to that sort of situation yeah and i think i mean i think that's a really good point our company and i think most most companies have or larger companies have a utilization expectation so out of the 40 hours that you week work they expect you to bill 80% Let's say that's a that's a high utilization. That's more for somebody who is a you know who's really a, a laborer. And then you have management where your billability is is lower than that, but then your billing rate is higher. And exactly what Doug is saying, although I don't typically have that issue, but I could see how that could happen. And but why? So why are we having managers that are at a higher billing rate and are you know, billing with a lower utilization when the laborers are expected to be, the technicians are expected to be at 100% utilization. How is that fair? But those are, you know, the managers many times, not all of them are created equal. Many of them are not. (laughs) But a good manager knows how to bring the work in. And there's a difference between, I mean, we see this all the time where people are getting laid off in smaller companies you have one person, that one person may have a really great connection with a few people, but they're only one person. The larger company that you have, the more connections that you have and the more consistency of work that you have. And so, you know, those managers, if let's just assume that they're good managers are worth their cost for sure, is they're the ones that are continuing to bring in money at, you know, in clients and ensuring that everyone else still has work and isn't going to get laid off. Go ahead, Doug. Yeah, so I was just going to sort of bring us back to the whole idea of of, uh, what Heather was saying is you're making assumptions about what you're going to find and that's how you're putting together your your budget. Um, And then that budget is what goes out to, um, you know, the people reviewing. And for anyone listening to the podcast who are reviewing not all of those assumptions are always transparent to the people reviewing because uh, we have a lot of consultants who will be like, yeah, yeah, I put out, uh, I got three tenders back, two are in the same ballpark and one was just completely out there. And we're like, why did they even bother? But you know, some of that, some of that is people are putting in tenders, hoping not to get the work, but want to keep that relationship up with the client. Mm-hmm. Um, but some of it is actually, they've made some assumptions and that's, that's what they think it will cost. And it may very well cost that amount. And that's, it goes back to the sort of, you know, winning and losing. And, and I know we ended the last segment with uh, Chris saying, you know, you, you, there's only two things you could do, win and lose. <laughs> I, I would say there's more because there's, there's, there's winning, but in the long run, losing. Like, like there's just contracts on paper you've won, but really you've, you, you've lost. Um, and mm-hmm. it's gonna hurt when you find stuff and you're you're under budget um, and you don't have the resources to do it, and that's coming yeah. out. Um, and then there's 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 losing, but in the long run, running uh, winning, and that you you didn't get that project, but then that project ends up to being uh, a hellscape, you know, absolutely yeah. horrible that would have ruined mm-hmm. your life and taken you know ten years off of it. <laughs> so, so there's, there's, uh, on paper, they'll be winning and losing, but actually it's much later that you figure out if you've actually won or not. Indeed. And sometimes you don't. I think, you know, sometimes you lose, I've had this happen too, where you're getting a lot of work from an agency and they don't want there to be a perception that they're, the fix is in and that they're going to always use you. And so sometimes they actually know that they have another project that's coming up that they really think you as a company would do really great with. And they want 
you on that project, they may not select you for a project you're proposing on. And so you just cannot take it personally, but you always want to learn from it. And there's ways to do that, but you always want to learn from a loss and a win, you know, but understand that it, you know, it's business. You're not going to yeah. win everything you propose for. And I, honestly, like my, my team's always like, Heather, stop. <laughs> we win a lot. Actually we do. We, our, our win percentage is very high. Yeah. It's because of the relationships that we have, but you know, sometimes on the team, they're like, Heather, can you stop proposing <laughs> projects? Because like you, there's only so much you can do. And that's the other thing is that, you know, when you have a good relationship with the client, you do not want to put that in jeopardy by just haphazardly proposing on everything, right? Yeah. You have to have some discipline. Otherwise you are going to shortchange your good clients and then, then where are you going to be? Sure. Yeah. That's actually like number one thing from consultants that come back. It's actually they wish people would just instead of bidding and wasting everyone's time, they wish people would just come to them and say, "Listen, we're we're not in a position to do this project, or we don't think we can do it. If you need the three bids to, you know, get through whatever internal thing, we'll we'll throw in one if you absolutely need it. But if not, we'd like to skip that one." And actually, consultants and the people reviewing it much appreciate that. Appreciate that. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, but you have to you have to have that there's a lot of fear in archaeology and a lot of people fear that if they're not bidding, then they're, and they're going to get passed up or they're not going to get that opportunity next time. Like if they pass on a, not, not necessarily a public uh, tender, but if someone came to them with a sort of private, you know, request, they always feel that they have the obligation to go forward with it. And sometimes that's not the best thing. And mm -hmm. honesty definitely will help that relationship. And, and back to what Heather was saying also is like, uh, yeah, talk to people who, who do these reviews and uh, and assign it. You'll find out like sometimes, especially for like smaller projects, so they'll, they'll throw it to someone new, yeah, not their, their normal people because they want to sort of have a variety and they want to see how they're this these new people are going to do, and they'll test them out on smaller projects. And you 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 could have had a much better proposal. You could have been cheaper. You could uh, everything could have been better, but. It's not necessarily about that from the client's point of view, or they're, they're just wanting to, you know, test out. They have a lot of work and they're like, well, let's see how these people do. And maybe we can yeah. bump them up and, you know, if they're quality and it's, it's testing out. Mm -hmm. There's other things, you know, federal contracts, uh, you get the women owned and minority owned business points or veteran points. I'm not saying uh, I actually think that's a good thing, but again, that's something that you can't always control. There'll be, I, I've been on a project where there was two, two sections of it. We bidded for both. I think our bid was much better because we actually anticipated um, that they, the two parts would have to work together, but they weren't, the uh, client wasn't willing to internally, they couldn't give both to one company. So they split right. it up that project went sideways because the other company that got the other side of it hadn't actually anticipated working across the two, two aspects. Yeah. And that, I think that was extra 10 grand. I mean, that's not a lot of money, but you know, it was, it was, it was a fair chunk that just had to be instantly with the contract put out to, before the project even started, they had to redo the budget because they hadn't actually anticipated that, but they couldn't, they couldn't give that, we had, but they couldn't give us the both yeah. aspects of the of the contract. So there's, man, there's so many different ways you could lose a contract or win a contract. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think that's, yeah. uh, if, if I could end with, just because you won, don't, uh, we're, we're talking about learning experiences, but you really need to make sure you absolutely understand because there's a, a tendency if you won to think that you're actually doing things right. Um, and it may actually be you won, you were actually the worst option, but there were other mitigating factors that made sure that you got it. And yeah. you, I, I would recommend if you win or lose a contract, always contact the people. If if they're willing to give feedback, not, all, not everyone has the time or ability to and get that feedback because you shouldn't assume you've won it and that you could, should keep doing what you're doing because it could have been a different, different aspect. Yeah. Okay, well, you're getting into what we want to talk about next time because we didn't really get to talk about this time, you know, 
winning and losing and stuff like that, we, we had a lot more to talk about. So I think we might push out to the next episode. I'll take some notes on, on what we didn't get to. And, and we might push this to a proposals part two uh, on the next episode of the CRM archaeology podcast. So with that, I think we'll say goodbye. Thanks Heather for all the fantastic information. Yeah. Thanks Doug for the input and we will see you guys next time. Thanks to everyone for joining me this week. Thanks also to the listeners for tuning in, and we'll see you in the field. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye, everybody. This episode was produced by Chris Webster from his RV traveling the United States, Tristan Boyle in Scotland, Dig Tech LLC, Cultural Media, and the Archaeology Podcast Network, and was edited by Chris Webster. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com.